So good afternoon to all. Thank you to ACP for inviting me. I would like to thank especially Dr. Anuj Maheshwari, Dr. Narsingh Verma and the, all the entire team of ACP India for inviting me to be here today. Uh, the topic given to me is about thyroid disorders in pregnancy, a case-based discussion. So in the next 17-18 minutes or so, I'll discuss this topic. So if you look at thyroid disorders, they're very common today. There are very common endocrine problems in pregnancy. Uh, overt hypothyroidism occurs in about 3 to 5 percent of all pregnancies and subclinical hypothyroidism occurs in much much higher prevalence of 10 to 15 percent of all pregnancies. Hyperthyroidism occurs in a much smaller number and postpartum thyroiditis is the other problem that is common in women during pregnancy. Now what I'll try to do is I'll just discuss about the physiological changes in, of thyroid in pregnancy and then go on to discuss in a case-based manner uh, the, many of the issues that, that are listed here. So if you look at uh, the changes that happen in the thyroid function during pregnancy, what happens is that the first issue is the increase in estrogens during pregnancy leads to a rise in thyroid binding globulins by two to three fold and that leads to increase in the total hormones, the total T4 and total T3, while the free hormones would remain normal or maybe slightly on the lower side. And uh, because of the increase in HCG, which happens in early pregnancy and peaks around the 10 weeks, the HCG, is, HCG has a structural similarity to TSH and can stimulate the release of T3 and T4. And it can also cause a transient suppression of TSH in the first trimester of pregnancy, in late in the first trimester. Peripheral metabolism of thyroid hormones is increased and that can lead to decreased levels of free T4 and free T3. Plasma volume is increased and in addition to this, the plasma, the fetal thyroid starts functioning from the uh, from the 10 to 12 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks of gestation and that adds on to the requirement of iodine in pregnancy. And uh, so it could, I mean, you could, you could summarize all this by saying that it's a physiological pregnancy is a significant physiological stress leading to a near pathological outcome. This figure, which is taken from the Nature Reviews article, uh, which was looking at thyroid disorders in pregnancy and has actually highlighted uh, all these issues in one uh, one picture, which uh, clearly shows the factors which are increasing the maternal iodine requirement during pregnancy. Now, let's look at some of the interesting uh, case scenarios. Uh, which would help us in understanding the thyroid disorders in pregnancy. So this is a 27-year-old woman who is planning for pregnancy. She has been started on folic acid. She has read about thyroid diseases in pregnancy and is concerned about that. There is no family history of thyroid dysfunction, no history of any autoimmune disorders in the family. She wants to know whether she should get a thyroid function test, test done during pregnancy. So what do you want to do? So if you look at the current recommendations, for identifying hypothyroidism in pregnancy, it's largely based on screening using the TSH levels. According to the ATA guidelines, there is insufficient evidence to recommend for or against use of using universal screening with TSH at the first antenatal visit. As of now, ATA recommends only targeted screening. And whom do they target for screening? They are women over the age of 30 years, those with a family history or of autoimmunity, or those with uh, a goiter, those with a previous history of thyroxine therapy, those who are having living in a presumed iron deficient area, those who have got previous miscarriages, other autoimmune conditions like uh, type 1 diabetes, those with infertility, and uh, those with uh, clinical signs and symptoms uh, suggestive of thyroid hyperfunction. So in all these... Uh, situation they would suggest uh, a thyroid test to be done but otherwise they would not recommend a universal screening but you look at the uh, epidemiology of hypothyroidism in our country it's much higher than what we see in the western countries western countries is just about subclinical hypothyroidism two to three percent of all pregnancies over hypothyroidism in 0.3 to 0.5 percent but look at our uh, our population in a study from mumbai it was uh, the prevalence was 4.8 percent sahu et al showed uh, 6.47 percent of uh, subclinical hypothyroidism and uh, overt hypothyroidism in almost five percent of uh, our uh, of women during uh, during antenatal period and one interesting study that we had conducted across 11 cities uh, in nine states of our country we found uh, that the prevalence was to the tune of 13.13 percent 
uh, for where hypothyroid using using a cutoff value of 4.5 percent TSH cutoff value of 4.5 micro international units per ml. So clearly showing that this is uh, subclinical hypothyroidism again. So this prevalence is much higher than uh, it would have been much higher if you had used the American ATA criteria. ATA 2011 criteria was speaking of a cutoff of 2.5 when we did the study that was what was commonly being used but when you look at we used a a, a, a tsh cutoff of 4.5 and we got a, a prevalence of 13.3 percent and 20 percent of the women were were positive for autoantibodies anti-tpo antibodies so if you look at other studies also uh, there were there was a meta-analysis of uh, uh, of 10 eligible studies uh, which were uh, for understanding the need for doing universal versus uh, versus uh, targeted screening four studies demonstrated that universal screening may lead to less miscarriages and pregnancy complications and two of the studies demonstrated that universal screening would be cost effective also and if you look at uh, other studies which have looked at uh, looked at this uh, issue uh, most of them have shown that uh, when you do a universal screen i mean if you are going to do a targeted screening you would miss out all as 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 much as 80 percent of women who develop hypothyroidism in the multi-center cohort study by buying it all while others reported as much as 30 to 60 percent uh, missing out rates of hypo of detecting hypothyroidism so it's clearly seen that uh, uh, based on this the indian thyroid society in two, 2012 itself recommended universal screening for our population the 2019 update of the ITS guideline also recommends uh, recommends a universal thyroid screening for thyroid dysfunction in pregnancy. Now, the other important issue, having looked at this issue in quite quite some detail, I'll go on to discussing about the reference ranges of TFT in pregnancy. So there has been a lot of confusion about this uh, reference ranges. It is seen that uh, the reference ranges in different populations would be different. And hence, there is need for, uh, they would differ by ethnicity, maternal iodine status, the laboratory assay method used, and the rigor for selection of reference population. So all these lead to variable variation in that. And in fact, the ATA guideline of 2011 was uh, based mainly on the reference ranges uh, of the U.S. population, and hence uh, the many, many, many experts felt that there was probably an overdiagnosis because we were looking at the reference ranges of the of the U.S. populations, and therefore the recommendation was to use population-specific reference ranges in the subsequent guideline of 20, uh, 2017. So, if you look at the reference ranges for India itself. We would say that uh, there are there there are probably two studies which have this is a study from Marwa et al. and uh, they have shown the reference ranges in each of the trimesters. As, as you can see, the upper cutoff of the reference ranges somewhere around 4.3, 4.4 in the first trimester, 4.43 in the second trimester, 4.1 in the third trimester. And if you look at uh, at another study by uh, Rajesh Rajput, he has uh, shown the cutoffs again. Uh, in the first trimester, the cutoff of TSH was 1.78, 4.47 in the second trimester, and third trimester was 4.64. So as you can see, these uh, these cutoffs are 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 what we should be using for our for the diagnosis of hypothyroidism in pregnancy in our population. Now the other issue that I would like to also highlight here is that if you're looking at um, total versus uh, total t4 versus free t4 measurement there is always a difficulty in doing a uh, getting a a good essay for doing the free t4 because it requires separation by equi equilibrium dialysis which is which has been uh, and this can have um, uh, problems uh, in the essay because most of the essays that are used are not not uh, very good for doing this and therefore we should uh, what is suggested is that we should continue measuring the total t4 and use one and a half times the upper limit of normal as the cutoff during pregnancy. So that obviates the need for doing a free T4 measurement. Now let's move to the second case. This is a 28 year old lady with a history of primary hypothyroidism. She presented with amenorrhea for six weeks and she was diagnosed to have hypothyroidism. It's about six years back, she was on altroxin. Uh, she was on levothyroxine at a dose of 75 micrograms for the past two years and uh, she had a diffuse non-tender enlargement of the thyroid gland uh, earlier in prior i mean when she presented now during pregnancy 
her laboratory investigation showed a tft mm. of um, tft uh, such as, um, which was showing a tsh of 10.75 free t3 and free t4 which were in the normal ranges a urine pregnancy test was positive the usg showed a gestational sac, sac of six weeks so what are the options that we have in this patient should we maintain the same dose of levothyroxine should we increase the dose of levothyroxine or should we terminate pregnancy so these are the options that come to the mind of of the um, physician and uh, the appropriate response would be to increase the dose of levothyroxine here it would be to increase it to 100 microgram per day this which would mean about a 30 percent increase and we need to in fact even before pregnancy we need to ask women counsel women to target the tsh to less than 2.5 prior to pregnancy itself once the patient conceives she will require an additional dose of about 30 percent higher dose maybe ranging from 20 to 40 47 percent higher dose and uh, a simple way in which you can do is increase the tablets by two tablets per week whatever dose the patient is taking whether the patient is taking 50 micrograms you increase two tablets uh, per week and that takes care of the additional requirement and this can be done before the patient comes to you uh, itself this advice can be given and once they come to you you can you can uh, always assess thyroid function and decide the adequacy of the dose and you can dis uh, decide on 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 adjusting the dose accordingly so this patient who had a who who had increase in dose to 100 micrograms uh, underwent a test again after two after four weeks and uh, was found to be in the normal range the tsh was found to be in the normal range and uh, she was continued uh, with that dose and she had a periodic evaluation every four to six weeks and 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 uh, so the ideal way would be to evaluate every four to six weeks mm -hmm. and uh, preferably at least once in a once in each trimester if not at every four to six weeks so coming to hypothyroidism in pregnancy it could either be overt hypothyroidism as we all know where there is increase in tsh levels along with increase in uh, or uh, along with a decrease in the t4 and t3 and there could be symptomatic thyroid hormone deficiency while subclinical hypothyroidism is more common where there is elevation of tsh levels without uh, decrease in the ft3 or ft4 and uh, biochemical this is a biochemical thyroid hormone deficiency many times may not have any clinical features associated with that so what are the various reasons why a woman may develop hypothyroidism during pregnancy it may be because of uh, because of autoimmunity as we have just uh, seen in most of our patients treatment of hyperthyroidism uh, for um, using radioactive iodine or ablation um, uh, or surgical removal or uh, or it could be uh, or it could be uh, hypothyroidism of of pituitary or hypothalamic origin also in some situations but uh, whatever the cause of hypothyroidism it has an impact on the maternal and fetal outcomes in the in the mother it can lead to anemia congestive heart failure antepartum depression eclampsia preeclampsia gestational hypertension placental abruption uh, and so on and so forth so a lot of uh, uh, problems are associated particularly important are miscarriages and uh, and 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 uh, preterm delivery and preeclampsia so these are the three major problems that we are worried about and if and does subclinical hypothyroidism also cause these problems that's the that's the major question that is there and uh, there have been a lot of uh, uh, data which has been, i mean a lot of studies which have looked at tried to look at uh, uh, treating subclinical hypothyroidism to see whether it improves the outcomes uh, and and uh, these are some things which i'll just quickly present in the next few minutes so if you look at uh, one of these uh, studies recently published studies in jcm uh, this was uh, this was uh, looking at subclinical hypothyroidism or hypothyroxinemia and, and the ob obstacle outcomes so as you can see if you look at all the outcomes there was not much of a difference between all the different outcomes but the major ones which were which were showing a difference was prematurity uh, and and uh, respiratory distress syndrome so metal and serum concentration of more than four micro, micro uh, four in the pregnancy was associated with a pro approximately two-fold increased risk of prematurity and rds in the offspring elevated tsh level was also associated with statistically statistically non-significant increase in the risk of fetal loss preeclampsia eclampsia and low birth weight so this is how you see that there are some 
factors which are clearly affected others may be affected now uh, the more contentious issue is uh, about the uh, where you have more conflicting evidence is the effect on on uh, the child's neurodevelopmental outcomes so if you look at those outcomes there is probably more of confusion in that uh, uh, mild maternal thyroid hyperfunction has been shown to be to have a deleterious effect on child on the child's neuro neurodevelopmental outcomes in multiple cohorts if you look at some of them one one was a danish cohort of uh, almost 4000 mother children pairs and uh, what we clearly see from that study was that both low and high maternal levels of free t4 in early pregnancy were associated with lower child iq and higher likelihood of an iq of less than 85 at 6 to 8 years of age compared with normal levels uh, normal levels of maternal free t4 so uh, and if you look at another uh, this analysis the maternal uh, in this analysis, however, the maternal serum TSH levels did not predict the child's IQ. Brain MRI has shown alterations in child uh, in the child neuroanatomy associated with either low or high maternal thyroid function. The strongest effect was observed when thyroid function was measured between 8 to 14 weeks of gestation. So this these findings suggest that the 8 to 14 week period is very critical period for the effect of thyroid hormone on fetal brain development. Of note is uh, if you look at this longitudinal study of um, again a, about 4,000 odd uh, UK mother child pairs, they did not show a significant association between maternal levels of TSH or free T4 measured in the first trimester and the standardized test scores of children from age of 54 months through 15 years. So clearly, uh, there is a disparity between different studies. Some of the studies have shown some uh, some change, uh, some uh, benefit of of treatment while others have not shown and um, if you look at another meta-analysis of uh, 2018 of 26 studies they they found a significant association between maternal subclinical hypothyroidism or hypothyroxinemia and the measures of child intellectual development such as low iq language delay global developmental delay so all these were clearly shown in this in this meta-analysis all the questions remains to be several questions remain to be answered observational data strongly suggests an association between maternal levels of free t4 in early pregnancy and child's neurodevelopmental outcomes now let us look at another contentious issue which is there in the management of thyroid dysfunction in pregnancy this is a 30 year old pregnant woman coming with normal tft and strongly positive anti-DPO antibodies. So this is another scenario that we commonly see where you have normal TFT, but a increase in anti-TPO antibodies. So this patient is concerned regarding the same. How would you counsel her? You have another two so if you look at 10 to 20% of all pregnancies in the first trimester are having anti-TPO antibody positivity. 16% of these women who are youth thyroid and positive for anti-TPO antibodies in first trimester develop a TSH greater than four in, by the third trimester. And almost 33 to 50 percent of these women who are positive for anti TPO or anti TG antibodies in the first trimester will develop postpartum thyroiditis also. So, this is how this predicts subsequent development of uh, hypothyroidism and postpartum uh, thyroiditis, but they could also have impact on the on the uh, causing by causing miscarriages spontaneous miscarriages they can increase the risk of spontaneous miscarriages premature delivery placental abruption and postpartum thyroiditis two major hypotheses have been proposed one is that this the the anti tpo antibody positivity reflects a general generally a diffuse autoimmune process or it may be that tpo antibody positivity is driving the thyroid dysfunction and subsequently resulting in poor out obstetric outcomes so uh, a recent prospective study has shown that with the recurrent pregnancy losses they found that anti tpo antibody positivity was associated with reduced live birth rate i mean they were particularly focusing on this and uh, they found that treatment with uh, thyroxine improves increases the live birth rate significantly however what is the balanced view on this the view is that universal screening for thyroid antibodies and possible uh, and and possible uh, uh, treatment is not recommended for all pregnant women with TSH more than 2.5 should be evaluated for anti-TPO antibody status. Youth thyroid pregnant women who are antibody negative 
uh, antibody positive should have a measurement of serum TSH concentration per performed at time of pregnancy confirmation and every four weeks throughout mid uh, through up to mid uh, mid pregnancy. So we are short of time. Please conclude your. Uh, and what do the ATA guidelines say about pregnancy? Uh, about management of hypothyroidism during pregnancy, they speak about uh, using pregnancy specific ranges, which we already discussed about. And they said that if you don't have a pregnancy specific range, use four as ID ID cutoff or or a point five. Uh, difference between the normal uh, pregnant <laughs> normal uh, normal okay. persons and <laughs> pregnant women and uh, where do they recommend treatment of subclinical hypothyroidism while well, treatment of overt hypothyroidism is obviously recommended subclinical hypothyroidism should be treated with levothyroxine in, in patients who are antibody positive with tsh greater than the pregnancy specific reference range tpo antibody negative women with tsh greater than the greater than 10 and uh, it should be considered it may be considered for people who are for those women who are tpo antibody positive with tsh concentrations more than 2.5 and below the upper limit of the pregnancy specific reference range so we are that running is four out in of this case. and tpo antibody negative women also may be considered with tsh concentrations greater than the pregnancy specific reference and below 10 that is between 4 to 10 Levothyroxine is not, however, not recommended for TPO antibody negative women with a normal TSH value, that is TSH value uh, uh, below the cutoff of the reference range. Now, what happens to those who are diagnosed during pregnancy? How much is the dose that is they require? They have a, a reduction in the requirement. They, many of them do not actually remain, remain hypothyroid and many of them can be uh, actually uh, do not require any, any, any replacement. But some of them do require. Who are those? Those advanced, advanced stage, those who have a goiter, those who have family history, positive family history of thyroid dysfunction, those with thyroid autoimmunity. Uh, they are at future uh, risk of hypothyroidism and these patients should be receiving treatment. And again, regarding the dose also, we had done an observational study where we found that um, majority of patients with overt hypothyroidism during pregnancy require more than half of the final dose after delivery. While those with uh, with uh, subclinical hypothyroidism without a goiter and without any associated uh, with with, uh, with uh, or those who are associated with higher T4 levels after delivery, they are the ones who probably do not require replacement therapy. Uh, and finally, uh, let's look at another me. aspect of the story that is uh, this 29 year old lady who is presenting with at 10 weeks of gestation with uh, with a thyroid function which is suggestive of thyrotoxicosis that is with the TSH which is suppressed FT4 index which is high T3 which is high Yeah, this is. she has no previous history of thyroid disease she is feeling well apart from nausea she has been quite okay otherwise with nausea and MSS intermittently throughout the day for the past two weeks on examination her thyroid is normal in size without any nodules or tenderness and she has no ophthalmopathy also. So what do you so do in this in this uh, me, young lady who is present you, you can call him uh, on with mobile. these symptoms and with okay. with this report? Would you start her on methimazole? Would you start her on PTU? Would you obtain a radioiodine uptake scan for her? Would you repeat her thyroid function test or would you do a thyroid ultrasound? So if you look at this lady, I mean, look at the various problems during pregnant uh, during i mean in pregnancy with hyperthyroidism this can be because of graves disease which is the commonest cause subacute thyroiditis which is which is the next commonest cause then you have other other causes like toxic multinodular multinodular goiter toxic adenoma a tsh dependent thyrotoxicosis can also happen and exogenous t3 t4 uh, can also be factitiously causing thyrotoxicosis Pregnancy specific conditions are the ones which have to be kept in mind. Hyperemesis, gravidarum is one common condition. Hydratiform mole, mm -hmm. common condition, but should be kept in mind. HCG mediated hyperthyroidism. So yes. these are all the situations that Shall have to be kept in mind. Number? An yes. important thing is that these can uh, hyperthyroidism also can lead to complications, maternal complications like congestive heart failure, thyroid storm, preeclampsia, spontaneous abortions or a preterm delivery also, while the fetal complications right. mainly so are in the form of neonatal deaths, 2 to 3 increase in frequency of low birth weight uh, infarcts, 
and yeah, uh, fetal and neonatal hyperthyroidism is another, uh, another common uh, problem that is okay. noted in these patients and congenital malformations are also likely to occur IUG, apart from IUGR. Now if you look at what the ATA guideline is saying is, is that in newly pregnant women uh, at TSH uh, uh, who are on low doses of methimazole or, or PTU they can actually be stopped from uh, discontinued the medication because there's a increase in the requirement of thyroid hormones during pregnancy and this decision should be taken after taking account the history uh, history of the goiter size the duration of therapy and all these things have to be taken into account and uh, uh, you should continue monitoring the patient even though you may not be giving thyroxine at that time if the pregnant woman remains clinically and biochemically you thyroid uh, test intervals may be extended from two to four weeks during pregnancy uh, during pregnancy to uh, three to four weeks and um, what we also uh, what is also recommended is that ptu should be used as uh, preferably in the first 16 this in what happened individualized regarding whether they require treatment or not graves disease is commonest cause of hyperthyroidism and uh, it has to be dis distinguished from uh, gestational trophoblastic uh, gestational thyrotoxicosis and trophoblastic disease treatment is generally with with antithyroid medications ptu being the first of its kind and uh, neomarcosal in in subsequent periods so with that i'll conclude